Hey, students. All right, let me do my uh, third example as a, a supplement here, number uh, 20. And uh, I'll work through this one. Let's see, I uh, guess I uh, decided to print it again. I thought it was a little bit easier to see on the screen. But uh, let's uh, read this one here together. It says, a point A on the Carnot cycle, 2.43 moles of a monotonic ideal gas at a pressure of 1,400 kilopascals and a volume of 10 and a temperature of uh, 720. The gas is expanded uh, isothermically to the point B and then expanded adiabatically to the point C where its volume now becomes 24.0 liters. An isothermic compression brings it to point D where its volume is this. An adiabatic process returns it back to the point A. Now, all of that description is probably worth putting a PV diagram. But as I said right at the beginning of this problem, that this is a, a Carnot cycle, um, I, and we studied Carnot cycles, I'm thinking you're kind of familiar with this. So A expands in an isotherm to B. There it expands adiabatically to C. Then it begins its return where it is compressed isothermically to point D and then adiabatic back to A. And so there's our PV uh, diagram here. And I'm going to just do the diagram here because I want to emphasize that uh, I think you should always do the PV diagram. And it just kind of helps your thought process. Now, they tell us the number of moles, so I'll put that in my chart as 2.34 moles. That was given right at the, the beginning. Uh, keep in mind what type of gas it is. It's a monoatomic, so maybe it's like uh, neon or something. And they say the gas has this pressure and this volume and this temperature at point A. And they put it in this little chart. And I'm glad they do, because what I'm going to say is you should probably always make a little chart when you're dealing with the state functions. Yeah, what is the, you know, the pressure? What is the volume? And what is the temperature? And so they tell me that in units of kilopascals, and liters, and I'm just debating if I should change the units. Uh, remember, I like to work with R as 8.31 because that's the one that's in units of joules. But, uh, and of course, a, a joule is a pascal times a cubic meter. But another nice feature here is that if you multiply the pressure by a thousand and divide the volume by a thousand, you get the same thing. So I could call this a kilopascal when I multiply by a thousand. And then when I divide by a thousand, that's a, a liter. And so it's kind of nice to also remember that a kilopascal times a liter comes out to also be a joule. And then that way I'm using the units of liters, which can be convenient. Uh, still not using atmospheres. If we used atmospheres, we would have to use that, that R that, uh, like I said, is... Not as useful because it's not dealing with energy. But I think I'll go ahead and use this ratio. That I'll go ahead and do my units in kilopascals for the pressure, and I'll do my volume in, in liters. So when they give me the 1,400 kilopascals, 10 liters, and 700 
and 20 degrees. I'll just put that right into my chart. In fact, they helped me out at the beginning. They, they made a chart for me and they put that in. And then they just say it expands isothermically to the point B and then expands adiabatically to the point C where it has a volume of this. And then they say it has a volume of this. And so they put that in the chart for you. So let me make the chart and then tell you that, you know, the first thing you should do in a problem like this is of course, fill in all the given information. Those are the, the easiest ones. Because my hint for you then is would be find the things that are constants, you know, because we have those processes like isobaric where it means the same pressure. Now, we don't have an isobaric in this problem, but if we did, I would say point it out and maybe you can just transfer the pressure from one point to another because it doesn't change. So we don't have an isobaric or an isovolumetric, but we do have two isotherms. So the A to B has the same temperature. So why don't I just take advantage of that and say, look, whatever the temperature is at A, it's got to be the temperature at B. And for that matter, C and D have to have the same temperature. Ah, well, I'll just put a little symbol here saying that they're going to be the same, but uh, I don't know either one of them. But the, the point is, if I just found one, I could then go without the, the others. In fact, maybe I better read the, the question here. It says, determine all of the unknown pressures, volumes, and temperatures as you fill in this table. So this is part A, fill in this, this table. Okay. Um, now keep in mind also that PV equals to NRT. And so we're given N, and so looking at this chart, if we know any two, we can find the, the third, although that really doesn't help either. And as I scan across, it doesn't help me with B, doesn't help me with C, and doesn't help me with, with D. So bummer, but uh, like I said, might as well look for the easy ones first. So like I said, do the givens first, then do the ones that are the same, then look for any two that you have together. And in this case, I don't have any of those. Um, but maybe now I can start looking at the more complicated ones and I think things will fall into place. And this happens to be the adiabatic because we know that PV to a gamma equals PV to a gamma. And for that matter, we could change this to the other variables like T and V. Uh, we could also change it into pressure and temperature. But I digress. Let me just focus on that because I see it right away. I know that A and D are connected adiabatically. So if I call that an A and that an A and that a D and that a D, if I know any three of these, I can find the fourth. By the way, I do know gamma. Um, I didn't put it up here, but maybe I should remember gamma is Cp over Cv. And they said this was a monatomic gas. So we know we have three degrees of freedom. So we know the specific heat is three halves R and then the of constant volume. And so the specific heat or molar specific heat, that constant pressure would be five halves R. And so my gamma is 5 over 3, which would be 1.667. Okay. So we do know the gamma. And then that's what I, I see right here. I see an A and a B. I'm sorry. I see the pressure volume for A. And then as I look down in my chart here at D, I see a volume and no pressure. So the four that would fit this equation would be these four boxes. And I see three of them are already full. And so that th this is just perfect for that. So I could take the pressure, the 1,400 kilopascals at A, and multiply by the volume of 10 raised to a power of 1.667, and then leave this as the unknown pressure at D, and then the volume is 15 times 1.667. And then this will give me a chance then to calculate what is the pressure at point D. Um, how about? 
us to do this. Well, I'll just do this collectively together. 1400 times 10 raised to a power of, and I'll just do five thirds. Okay, so there's this side of the equation. Let me then divide that by 15 raised to a power of five thirds. And so I get a pressure of 712.3. And so putting that here, 712.3. And so D is about halfway up in, in A. And so you can kind of see here's a, here's a pressure up. About 700 and change, and then double that to D. So my drawing's not too bad, but not exactly written to scale. Okay. Uh, but I think that was kind of that uh, Rosetta Stone here. Now that I've got a connection, everything else kind of falls in place. I just needed that one piece to connect things together to make it easy. Kind of like the Rosetta Stone connecting... Ooh, Rosetta Stone connected what? Was it, I think, the ancient Greek writing with the ancient Egypt? Yeah. The hieroglyphics? Yeah, so I think, I think that's how the archaeologists finally learned to read the hieroglyphics, was they found that magical stone that said the same thing on the front and back, and one was in Greek and one was in... Uh, uh, ancient uh, hieroglyphics. Um, and now, from that, they figured out how to read all the ancient Egyptian stuff. Uh, anyways, but for us, this is the magical piece. This is the big connection. So that's why I call it the Rosetta Stone. Because no, notice that I have two. I can find that third one. And notice we said they match, so I can just put that up there. And then we have two. We can find that one up here. Um, and then, remember that... Uh, let's see, how are we going to get to B? Um, we uh, might have to do an adiabatic again here at, at, at B. So let's keep going. Uh, so what did I say here? So, so right here, temperature at D. So I'm going to say then the temperature at D would be pressure volume over NR, each at point D. Uh, so taking the pressure at D, which is already in my calculator, uh, multiplying it by the volume at D, which is the 15 liters, divide it by the number of moles, which we said was 2.34, um, and then divide it by R, 8.31, we get a temperature here of 500 and 49.4. So let me put that into my chart. So 549.4 Kelvin here. And that fills in here. And then that allows me to jump up and say, okay, well, that's going to also be the temperature at C because D and C is this isotherm connection. Which then at C, I've got these two. So I can jump over here and say, okay, so the pressure at C would be NRT over V. Uh, and again, temperature at C and volume at C. So grabbing my calculator, uh, 2.34 for the N, the R, 8.31. Uh, the temperature at C was our last answer. So there's it is in the chart, our last answer. And now I can divide that by the volume at C. And the volume at C was given as 24 liters. So this is a pressure then of 500 and... No, 445.2. And, and that's in kilo. Pascals. So 445.2 kilo pascals. And of course that is, you know, C and it's the lowest of them, and that makes that makes sense. And so when we warmed it, 
from C to D, right? We went from a lower pressure to a higher pressure. And um, I, sorry, I did I say warm? I didn't mean warm when we compressed it. So we went from 24 down to 15. We didn't change its temperature, but we changed its volume. So its, its pressure should be bigger at D compared to, to C. All right. Now, looking at D, I do think we need to go back to the adiabatic because we already said the A to B is taken care of um, in the sense that the same temperature. So that's how we got the, the temperature at, at B. But the only other thing we know about B is that it's connected adiabatically to, to C. And uh, the pressure and volume are the two missing. So we probably don't want to use this same relationship of pressure and volume because then we would have two unknowns in it. We should do the one that I, I scribbled out. And so temperature, volume, gamma minus 1 equals temperature and volume of gamma minus 1. And see, in that way, when I look at volume and temperature, I'm kind of looking at this block of four. And the three of them I have, and this one I'm, I'm missing. So I'm missing the volume at B. So if we write this as temperature at B, uh, volume at B, temperature at C, and volume at C... Uh, we should be able to work this out. And so let's find the volume at B. So I'll start with the temperature at B. So this is 720, and then the volume at B. And remember, it's gamma minus 1. And gamma, we said, was 5 thirds. So if you subtract 1, you end up with 2 thirds. And then the temperature at C is 549.4 and the volume at C is the 24 and that would also be raised to a power of two thirds. And so I'll do this in two calculations here. So I don't do too much on my calculator and risk a mistake. Uh, why don't I do the 24 raised to a power of 2 thirds? And then I will multiply that by 549.4. And I will divide that by 720. And so this isn't quite the volume. This is the volume raised to a power of two-thirds. So let me raise both sides to a power of three-halves. That would leave me with just volume at B. And so I'll take that number and raise it to a power of three over two and get, uh, looks like 16.0. And so 16.0 then is the volume at B. And now we're back to what we said earlier. If you know any two, you can find the third. And so the pressure at B would be NRT divided by V. And all of these at point B. So grabbing my calculator, this would be 2.34. R would be 8.31. And temperature at B is that 720. I will then divide it by the volume at B. Oh, and check my units. Let's see, I did R. Yeah, okay, and I'm doing the units of kilopascals for pressure and volume in liters. Okay, and so this should give me the pressure in kilopascals. And so it looks like about 875 here. So 875. Point zero kilopascals is what I get then for the pressure. All right, so I think I've answered, although this was kind of long, uh, but this was just A, determine all the unknown pressures, volumes, and temperature as you fill in this table. And maybe there was a better way to go. I don't think so. Um, uh, Again, that connecting piece was the important one. 
the adiabatic. And I had to do it twice, actually. And so those are easy to, to overlook. But uh, when you look at a PV diagram, you'll always see, you know, if you're trying to find something at B, it's connected to A and it's also connected to C. And so look at how it's connected. So in this case, finding it in B and connected to A, I can get information because it's constant temperature. And then I can get it connected to C because it's adiabatic. And so if I knew this group of three, I can get that fourth. And so that was kind of my thinking. And the big picture I wanted to show you is just kind of look at your diagram and you can always see D is connected to A and C, C is connected to D and B. And so you can get information about each point along there. And also keep in mind PV equals NRT. So if you know any two, you can then find the, the, find the third. And if you keep that strategy in mind, you can pretty much answer all these questions about what is the temperature, pressure, and, and volume, okay? And I suppose if you were wanting to check all this, you could then say, well, if you use this to calculate N, every one of these should give me the 2.34, 2.34, 2.34, and 2.34. If you took its pressure times its volume divided by RT, you should get that number. Like for example, let me, I'll just check one just to see if I did this right. But here's my pressure, 445.2, multiplied by a volume of 24. Uh, divided by the R, 8.31, and divided by the temperature, 549.4, I should get the 2.34, yep. And so I can really know right away whether I did anything wrong and then kind of fix it maybe before I turn it in for the test. Okay, so there's my different uh, state of it because this problem goes on a little bit uh, further. Uh, this problem has a part B, which also makes it a good illustration. It says, find the energy added by heat and by work and, and work, find the energy added by heat, the work done by the engine, the change in internal energy for each of the steps, A to B, B to C, C to D, D to A, and then a C. Okay, but um, this one I wanted to use as an opportunity to kind of do the same thing is let's look at an A to B, a B to a C, a C to a D, and a D back to an A. And then we can look at the change in internal energies. That's one of the things they say here, the change in internal energy. Uh, but the other one they said is the heat. And so there's the Q and there's the W. Okay. And so what is the change in each of these cycles? Okay, so um, using the, the table, um, I like to say the following. Uh, fill in the easy stuff. The first easy stuff is anything that's given. Well, there isn't anything given for this problem. So I'm going to say there's nothing to fill in that way. But also fill in any of the zeros. And so remember, the delta E is zero for constant temperature, the Q is zero for adiabatic, and the work is zero for isovolumetric. And so coming to this problem, we have two isotherms, A to B. And so A to B would be a zero there. And then as it goes from C back to D, so C to D would also be a zero two isotherms. And we have two adiabatics, the B to C, so B to C is an adiabatic, and the D to an A is adiabatic. And so that's what I always recommend first. Find your easy ones. The, the givens and the zeros are usually the easier ones. Now, let's hunt down the uh, next one, and usually I do the delta E because it's a state function. But I will pause before I get there because keep in mind 
the first law of thermodynamics. So if you know any two, you can get the, the third. Now, at this point, we don't know two of them, but I will keep that in mind. And keep in mind the net adds up. And since we're going in a cycle, these four must add up to zero because that's a state function. And then these two would be the same number but opposite in sign because they have to add up to zero. Now, those don't help me quite yet. So I'm going to go over to the state function calculation, NCV delta T, and remind you that even though this says constant volume, Keep in mind that I'm going to be able to apply it to a state function of delta E. So notice I'm not saying Q because then that non-state function would only be valid for constant volume, and I don't have that here. So I'm going to say let's not use that equation anywhere for this particular problem. Okay, But I do have it then here. And so I could do, say, the B to C. So this would be N C V, and then taking the temperature at C minus the temperature at uh, B. I might even remind myself that this B to C is an adiabatic expansion, so it's doing work on the in, in environment. So it's losing energy in terms of work. So this should be a negative number, and then this should be the same negative number. So this should come out to be a negative number. And so 2.34 is the number of moles. And as we mentioned earlier, CV would be 3 halves R, for the 3 degrees of freedom or monoatomic gas. And then the temperature at C is 549.4 and it's 720 at B. So as I grab my calculator here, 2.34 times, and if Three halves, if you let me put that as 1.5 times R times 549.4 minus 720. And then I have a negative 4,976. So right here, minus 4,976. Which, as I was saying earlier, these four should add up to be zero, so this is going to be plus 4,976. Uh, but you can also see that if I were to do the same calculation for D to A, I have the same temperature difference. I would have, you know, this... 720, then minus 500. So I'd get the same number, but opposite in sign. So sure enough, that would calculate out. And keep in mind what I said earlier about the first law of thermodynamics. If you know any two, you can get the third. So this must be uh, 4,976 here, and this must be a minus 4,976. So these are the adiabatic processes where the work done expanding here and the work done by compression here are the same. It's just here you're doing work on the gas from D to A, so it's a positive number. And here from B to C, it's expanding, so it's a negative number. Okay. And then we can come over here and say, okay, now how do I do these? Uh, fortunately, you can kind of see that they must be equal in magnitude but opposite in sign because they have to add up to zero. Okay, that's good. 
And we got the work done in an isotherm by saying it's the integral of minus P dV. And it was nice then to call the P an nRT over V because during the isotherm, the temperature is a constant, so I can pull it in front of the integral. And after I integral dV over V, I get the natural log of the ratio of the volumes. And so this is the work. And then, of course, the Q is the negative of the work. And so the Q is a positive NRT, LN, V final over V initial. And so that's a formula that you may or may not have remembered. It's worth probably just working out here. And so let's put in our numbers for the A to B uh, process. So 2.34 for the N, the R is 8.31. The temperature from A to B was that 720. And then I can go natural log. And uh, let's see, I'm going A to B. So it'd be the volume at B, which is 16, over the volume at A which I kind of scribbled there. I think that was a 10, yeah, it was a 10. And so this would be the Q. So this should be 6,580 go into the gas, which of course the gas being expanded does work on the environment, so it loses the energy. It loses the same amount. That's why the whole temperature doesn't change, and the delta E is zero. So we're putting heat into the gas and then also letting the gas do work. Okay. And then so over here, we can do kind of the, the same thing. Let me apply this same equation for the C to D process, so 2.34 times 8.31. Uh, the temperature on the C to D was that 549.4, and then it would be a natural log of the volume at D, so that would be 15 liters over the volume at C, which is 24. Notice that ratio is less than one. That's how we're gonna get then a negative here. So that makes sense from C to D. We're taking thermal energy out of it. Yeah, we're, although the temperature stayed the same because we're also compressing it. And it looks like what we took out of it was a negative 500 or 5,021. And so this is a plus 5,021. So again, during that C to D process, we squeezed it. We did positive work, and then we took energy out the same amount. So the temperature stayed the same, and that's why the delta E was a zero. And then, of course, you can see these numbers are equal and opposite. So they would come out to be equal and opposite and add up to zero. So that checks out, too. All right. Big problem, but a good problem. Because it then says that uh, we've done all this. Um, now it says, C, calculate the efficiency of this engine. And then show that it is equal to the efficiency of a Carnot cycle. Well, it is a Carnot cycle, so it, it should be. So let's, for part C, go, all right, well, what is the the Efficiency. So the definition of efficiency is the amount of work net coming out of our engine compared to how much heat uh, we put in. So back to our chart, maybe I need to get that. So let's add up the, the net work here. Um, 
and it looks like that number and that number equal and opposite, so I won't even pay attention to, to those. But let me do the 5,021 and subtract off the 6,580, and I come up with a negative 1,559. And a good thing that it's negative, that means the work came out of the gas, and that's why we call this an engine. It's coming out of the gas and doing something on the environment. That's good. Um, now, that number, when I put here for efficiency, I guess I should have written it with absolute values. I think that's how your author did it. Um, huh. Interesting how he wrote the absolute values. I, I'm just going to do both of them. But uh, that should be then this 1,559 joules of energy that the engine actually did. Okay. Um, now the heat going in, that is just this term. See, that's the positive one. So heat goes in and then heat comes out. So this would be the heat going in. This is the hot one, and then this is the cold one. And so this is, would be the 6,580 joules. And so that should give me an efficiency of... About 23... Point seven percent if I move the decimal. And then they want you to also calculate what we had worked out earlier about how the efficiency is related to the temperature differences. Okay, so I'll do that. So my temperatures were, let's see, the low one was 549.4. And the higher one was the 720. So if I go 1 minus 549.4 divided by 720, I get an efficiency of, not a surprise, 23.7%. Yay! All right. So I guess technically we're done with the problem. Um, I don't know if I should stop there because I've been talking a long time or I should just say, you know what, maybe just for educational purposes, uh, we should go back to part B and then just say... What is the change in entropy? Because when we started building these charts, we were talking about energies, not entropies. Uh, but we are also, before we were even introduced to entropy, but I think an added piece to this chart might be the changes of entropy. And then also showing that if you go through a complete cycle, you should get back to, to zero. So if anybody's hanging around and still listening, why don't we talk about and calculate the change in entropy from each of these? And so let me get a clean piece here. And I don't know if you want to call it part D that I'm just going to make up here. But the change in entropy would be the integral of the DS would be the integral of QDT. And so why don't I just do the A to B first? And so the delta S from A to B would be this integral of Q over t. Now, fortunately, these are pretty easy ones because A to B is the isotherm. It is the constant uh, temperature. And if you, you know, have any kind of integration with a constant temperature, you can pull that out in, in front. And so this just becomes a Q over a T. And so that would work for anything with a constant temperature. And the A to B is just that way. And for that matter, so is the C to the D. 
Uh, but, but looking then back at the, the chart from A to B, this was 6,580 joules. And the temperature was the 720 Kelvin. So if I take the 6,580 and divide it by the 720, I'm looking at a change of entropy of about 9.14 Joule Kelvin. And I'll put that in my little chart here, a plus 9.14 in units of Joule over Kelvin. And so that's the increase in entropy. And it makes sense. We're giving heat energy to it. And, of course, the temperature didn't go up, so they don't move more, but they do occupy a bigger space. And so that is more disorderedness, if you will, and that's why that's a plus number. Heat's a, a plus number. Now, as long as we're doing this, we might as well do the calculation from C to D, because from C to D, the logic would still be the same. It would be a constant temperature. And coming to our chart, the C to D is losing thermal energy. So this is a minus 521 joules at a temperature of, what was the temperature of that one? Aha, here's our part A, the 549.4 Kelvin. So I'll put the negative. And I'll put the 5,021 and divide it by the 549.4. And there is a negative 9.14 Joule Kelvin. And bringing back the chart here, then this is a negative 9.14. Okay. Now, again, notice the negative number because we're taking energy out. And also, notice we've taken less energy out, but see, we're at a lower temperature. And this is what I've been saying a couple times on this video, is, you know, when we're looking at this, the, the heat engines, um, or maybe it wasn't this, and here's number four, I guess it was this example, I said, you could actually take out the same amount of entropy as you put in at a lower temperature, because it's kind of like the entropy is more... Uh, concentrated or the entropy is connected to that lower temperature so the if the temperature goes down the amount of thermal energy can go down to get that same amount of, of entropy and so this is how we can make a heat engine we can actually take out the same amount of entropy that we put in but yet not take out the same amount of heat energy. And that's really the key to the operation of the engine. You see, we put in this much entropy, we need to take out that same amount of entropy. We put in this much thermal energy, but we can take out less thermal energy, leaving some energy left over to do work. And that's why the entropy is often referred to as the energy uh, that is unavailable to do work. We need it to take out the, the entropy and to deal with the entropy piece of the laws of physics. Okay, now technically I got one last piece, but you can see I kind of already implied these are zero when I said this goes in and this comes out, and then the total's got to be zero. And the reason these are zeros are these are adiabatic. And if you come back and try to do an integration of the integral of dq over t, and you kind of go back to your... Um, fundamental definition of an integral, you would say, you know, it's a limit as delta Q goes to zero of an infinite summation. So you're going to sum from one to infinity of a little small Q's over the current temperature. And so you would, you would, you know, actually be doing something like this. How much energy did you take out at that temperature? And so it would be like a little tiny energy over some temperature number one. Um, and then if you a little more energy at temperature number two, 
a little more energy, temperature number three, dot, 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 okay? And adiabatically, you're basically just saying, look, we're not changing the Q at all. Uh, this is all take out little, take out little, take out little. I shouldn't even say little, take out nothing. And so we've got a bunch of zeros, 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 zeros. So we're not taking any thermal energy out. Now, we are changing the temperature because we're taking energy out, but not thermal energy, or putting it in for that matter. Anyways, this whole integral is kind of easy to see that for the adiabatic process, it would be zero. And so B to C should be zero, and D to A should be zero. They're both adiabatic, although we now can have a discussion about reversibility in adiabatic, but that's getting a little about the cutoff point of, of this class, and so that's probably a, a good place to stop, especially since my video now is 45 minutes just to do this one problem. But this is a really good problem. If this problem made sense to you, uh, you're probably in a good position for the test because it's got a lot, maybe even all the pieces uh, that uh, these last couple of chapters in, entailed. All right, take care.